the uh, world of uh, TAVI uh, starts in the echo lab, goes to the cath, or the cath lab or the hybrid room and then comes back to the echo lab and everybody who works in echo will be dealing with these, even if you're not in a, a TAVI centre, you'll be seeing people working up for TAVI, you'll be seeing them afterwards. And so the measurements we take pre and post, as well as the interoperative part, will be important to all of us. Before uh, going to the operating room to put these devices in, we carefully have to measure this left ventricular outflow tract dimension. And I showed pictures about this before and just about every speaker has spoken about it. So not to belabor the point, except that you've got to get it right or you get either the valve being too big, in which case you get a risk of rupture, or too small and you get the risk of paravalvar leak or the valve just falling out. And so we emphasise over and over again all of these rules about measuring left ventricular outflow tract sizing. Having said that though, uh, the, 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 the world of measuring and final sizing has moved a bit more towards the CAT scan department and so the ECHO folks uh, tend to give uh, uh, an example or an indication of where they think the, the valve sizing is and the CAT scan seems to be the final arbiter. But as well as that, there are other elements here. For example, the core valve and probably the portico one too are a chalice-shaped device. They're self-centering, so when they, when they spring load out into position, they centre themselves and therefore you have to have a good amount of aorta above, the, uh, above the, where the valve sits so that the, the, uh, the cup part of the uh, frame can sit. So we measure diameters 50 millimetres above the valve. We also do this once we get into the operating room, we re-measure yet again and we try to do this in a freeze frame and we try and get carefully get into that, what I showed before, the, the green plane or the so-called uh, true annulus. And we measure and we measure and it said that within ECHO that TOE probably is the more desirable. We, we did test this and we found that TOE tended to measure everything about a millimetre bigger than the trans thoracics and so TOE uh, within the echo lab at the beginning was the standard. Having said that, the CT scan has moved forward to become that which we rely upon. Now the CT scan I showed you before is a multiplanar reconstruction. And what that actually means is that you have to keep twisting and turning the planes till you get it right. Now we can actually get these 3D pictures with the transesophageal echo. The trouble is you're looking side on to the valve and so side pixels are never as sharp as end on pixels in 3D and so we've been always dogged with this uh, blurriness. Having said that, this is uh, a publication by um, uh, pa uh, Partho Sengupta, who's uh, from New York, who has taken us through uh, a protocol. But to cut it short, we can get the 3D volume set, usually in the operating room, very similar to the 3D volume set they get in the, ca in the CAT scan. And the gist of it is, and what he says is, that you have to do this, and that is you have to be able to rotate the plane all the way through the 360 degrees. Because what you actually care about is that number one and number two and number three there in that right hand frame, uh, that those three points which are the bottom of the, each of the three uh, bowls of the, of, the, of the cusps, those three things are the plane. And so that you want to move your x-axis in green and then your y-axis in blue and so on. And you move those planes around either on your CAT scan or on your 3D echo and so, that they, so that the plane that you're making the measurements is exactly perpendicular to the axial plane of the valve. And that's similarly true from the uh, placement of the valve in the operating room. We'll, we'll, we'll show you that. However you get to it though, you want to end up with dimensions of the largest dimension, the, sm the smallest dimension, because remember this thing's oval shaped usually, the perimeter and the area. And it seems to me that the area has, been, has come out king as the thing we finally make the decision on the valve. We're, at the end of the day also, if you're really in trouble, when you blow up the, site, the balloon, which you do, we, most of these people we do a balloon valvuloplasty before, as a final procedure before um, before we uh, put the device in, either on the day or a week or two before. And if you blow up the balloon, if you think about that, that is the final dimension. And so just doing a measurement uh, via either echo or uh, via the angiogram of the balloon dimensions also should be very accurate. Now, you saw before these, this picture, and this is now the, new, uh, the, the newest of the, of the 3D scanners. So this is uh, one of the brand new pieces of equipment from uh, Siemens, and uh, this uh, is a game changer. So this 3D uh, uh, acquisition of uh, data is uh, processed in real time against a database of 1,000 uh, 3D scans which are stored in the memory of the, of the, of the scanner. Uh, and uh, as an interesting aside, this is an Accuson piece of equipment, but all the 3D uh, sets that we use for fingerprinting are all come from Philips, so I don't know if they each knew that they were doing that to each other. 
but the, what happens here is that immediately facial recognition software is applied to this uh, data and uh, against the, the memory bank of known mitral and aortic valve morphologies, the pixels are correctly identified as being aortic and mitral valve tissue. And if you look on the left there, uh, you can see that bottom, that bottom left plane there, that those green little things are tracking the, the, uh, the pixels of the aortic valve almost exactly. And this, is, this was done in about 20 seconds, our first go ever. And as you get better at it, you, you, we got better and better at it. But, the, but fu fundamentally, that pink thing on the left there is a computer-generated cartoon of exactly this person's exact aortic valve and mitral valve morphology. The, the trigones, the intervalvular fibrosa, the uh, dimensions and so on. And then from there, it's a very short step to there where the device then, again, against these known uh, set of data, then can generate uh, all sorts of dimensions. And I've just given a few here, but it's got about 50 things that it spits out. Importantly, you can see, though, that it gives out the annulus area and the annulus perimeter, which is what the, what the CAT scan people give us. So that we are a very short distance now from one single heartbeat acquisition uh, with pattern recognition. It takes 40 seconds to run this and you end up with these numbers. And you might say, well, garbage in and garbage out. If it's not good pixels coming in, it'll be, it won't be a good measurement. And this is obviously for us to be determined and validated often against CAT scan, but I think a huge step forward. Once you get these numbers, you end up with diameters, a smaller and a larger diameter. You end up with an area in millimetres squared and you end up with a perimeter in, in um, millimetres or centimetres. And this chart's on the wall of every cath lab that does, and hybrid room that does TAVIs and it gives you the ranges for each size, in this case of the, core, of the, uh, of the Edwards valve, uh, and how many square millimetres in cross-sectional area would correlate with respectively the 23, the 26 or the 29 millimetre valve. There's three choices for this valve and two choices for the other valve. And you try, you try and stay within the safety margin so that you're well in the, in the, in the, inside the bell curve of the appropriate size. And similarly, there are sizing uh, algorithms for which size of the, of the self-expanding valves. So before, the, before you go into the uh, procedure, uh, we do trans thoracic and transesophageal echo, we measure gradients, I talked about all that before. But there are some rule outs. For example, at the moment, bicuspid aortic valve is not well suited for these devices and largely they've been excluded from both trials and our clinical practice. Eccentric and nodular calcification, particularly great big chunks of calcium, sometimes stand in our way. Bulky or dilated coronary sinuses, uh, sorry, sinus of Valsalva or, or uh, ascending aorta can, can, can be a problem. And obviously, if you've got masses, vegetations, uh, fibroelastomas and things on the valves, that could be a problem. And, this, and, the, and the obstruction of the coronary ostium, I'll show at the end. These big, thick, uh, sigmoid sub-valve uh, sub, uh, left ventricular uh, septal uh, bulges like this are a real problem. The valves tend to ride up, as you'd expect, out towards aorta, and very large ones of these would be preclusive. Obviously, you check left ventricular function, look for mitral valve, aorta, and so on. And uh, in, the operating, uh, in the operating room, we often use the echo to help find where the ventricular apex is if we're doing transapical. So they're all the things you do before you get to the room, and you hope that you've got most of the things sorted out before you get into the room. And then in the operating room, as you've seen before, these hybrid rooms, they've got uh, uh, somewhere in the order of 18 or 20 televisions, which is probably just about the right number. And uh, that's important because you want everybody to be able to see everything. And when we first did... We've, when we first did these TAVI procedures, we had about the same number of people in the room as televisions. Now we have about four people turn up uh, as the enthusiasm has gone off and it's become more mainstream. But uh, what you need is a, uh, obviously an interventional guy, a surgical person, uh, echo, anaesthetist, and then their support staff. And everybody has to be on the same page. And the great value of the hybrid room is that everybody can see everything that's going on. We use the echo for many of the procedures, but not all of them. We use them, obviously, to outline the anatomy, but we should be well and truly there by then. And then uh, we take either, either in the room Dyna CT or, uh, or beforehand we will have had uh, actual CT. I've shown this picture earlier. And we use those CTs. I'll just go back for a step. We use the CT because on, this, on the CT there is respectively one two, three, these three points here, which are the bottom of that green plane I showed at the beginning. And we pick, use this to pick the LAO, RAO, cr cranial and caudal, so that when you're looking with the echo, with, sorry, with the fluoro, you're looking exactly across the line of those three points. They've got to be in a line. It's easy to get two in a line, but you've got to get the third one tilted so that they're square. That way you know that the fluoro is exactly square to the plane, because you're going to use the fluoro as much as anything to pick the height of the device. 
So pre, we do the echo, we do, and we watch things like the wires going across, and you see all this sort of stuff happening on the fly, either from above if you're doing a aortic or femoral, or from below if you're doing an apical. There's the example of the, um, of the, of the Edwards device, which we, we can put in, as I said, apically or, or from the aorta or from the femoral. So let's move forward. I just wanted to show you that this was not completely bloodless. There's the device being prepared, and these devices also have been put in backwards, just for your reference. Um, and in fact, there's a great big green arrow on them, and uh, they're putting them in backwards. The one was put in backwards in the United States, and luckily they immediately put another one forwards inside the backwards one. Before you... There's a, there's a few sphincter tightening tense moments there. Okay, so before you do it, you blow up a balloon to smash the valve flat. This is one last final thing, and this occurs during ventricular pacing with a rate of 200 beats a minute, so you get ventricular standstill. We measure that too. That's a good opportunity to get one last measurement. And then the device is put in. This is coming from the apical, this one, but they could equally be coming from above. I think in echo, we watch this in echo, and we watch it on fluoro. Oh, this is one of the hardest things, I think, to see within echo, exactly whereabouts along this thing here, which from there to there is the balloon, whereabouts along there the actual device is. But I think you can see here that it's from there to there. It's a very difficult thing. You've got to get your eye around it, and eventually you do. But what you want is you want the middle of the valve to be exactly at the green plane that I showed you before. So the middle of the valve has to end up exactly on the hinges of the aortic valve, uh, of the na native aortic valve. So we do it, and we do it, and we look, and we look. We actually do pacing runs to make sure that when you go into ventricular standstill, it doesn't move. And then once everybody's happy, call, um, call go put the pacing on at 200, watch the beats at the bottom, blow the thing up, the heart sits still. You see uh, usually stasis and bubbles forming around the place, which means you've got no cardiac output. You hold it up for about eight or nine seconds and then let the thing down again. With these balloon expandable valves, you get only one crack at this. So you can't move it, whereas the uh, self-expanding ones, you can pull them back in the sheath and have another go. But once you've got this in place. So immediately, though, that you d deflate the balloon, the valve is valving and uh, the person returns cardiac output usually fairly quickly. We wind up the blood pressure with vasopressors usually at this stage and straight away they've gone into, uh, into uh, uh, non-aortic stenosis mode. This is not going to run this one, but I, wh what's important about this, it would show the same thing, is that there will be one, two, three of those bottom points of each of the, of the uh, coronary cusps in line in this plane, so that if you look at this, you're looking straight square across the face. This is very important because that line, uh, one, two, three, that line there has to be exactly in the middle of the valve when it deploys. As soon as it's deployed, you're immediately working and uh, the aortic, you're no longer an aortic stenosis person anymore. You've now got normal aortic flow uh, and generally uh, very good flow straight away. In this particular case here, you can see this is a transapical one. Uh, the big, big cannula here, and straight away you can see uh, normal valve function, in this particular case, no regurgitation. We quickly look at uh, deployment position, look for gradients and leaflet flow, leaks and so on, make sure there's nothing near the coronary ostea, set, assess left ventricular function and so on. Next morning we'll have a look at the echo and, uh, and see that the thing's in the right place and uh, show that there's good leaflet function, measure the gradients, which you would expect to be small, but then we start to look for problems. So the bugbear of, uh, of uh, so far, the TAVI programs has always been a regurgitation. Now you might see regurgitation, valvular regurgitation, um, as particularly when you're in, in the operating room still and there's a wire through the valve, but actual leaking through the valve is pretty uncommon. The manufacturer seems to be pretty good. But the big deal, of course, is paravalvar regurgitation. Paravalvar regurgitation because it's not big enough, paravalvar regurgitation because you haven't blown it up enough, or, or, or paravalvar regurgitation because the thing is too high or too low, or something is stopping it fully deploying against the wall. Now, the thing about this, these sorts of leaks is that they, they often don't look that much. And so the, there's, a, there's a general uh, uh, tendency to undercall this in the operating room, notwithstanding the urge to get to lunch. And uh, so you tend to think it's less than it is. And they've, we've, it's been looked at carefully and there's a variety of mechanisms, valve too low, valve too high, not fully deployed and so on. Uh, but it's also very clear that we undercall it. And that we undercall it for a couple of reasons. One is that the actual jets are very small and skinny in their, in their, in their circumferential width. So they're actually slit-like. But they go around the circumference a lot more than anything we're ever used to seeing before. So valvular AR is a central hole, which is usually fairly big and fairly, fairly easy to see, 
paravalvular leaks which you see from surgical, um, surgical um, dehiscences and so on don't tend to be much of the circumference but they tend to open up wide. But these are often much of the circumference and, but fairly slit-like. And so we tend to underestimate them and there's no doubt we underestimate them compared to MRI and there's been a variety of approaches, for example trying to get uh, left ventricular stroke volume by 3D echo and comparing it and so on. But what we've learned is that the, it's about the imaging, about how you do it. Because when you do trans thoracic echo, you can only really see the leaks at the front of the valve because it's all metal and you can't see through it. And so the anterior leaks, uh, those leaks um, closest to the, the, the chest wall, are well seen by the trans thoracic echo. And the posterior leaks are well seen by the trans esophageal echo. And so a multiple uh, imaging a multiple of imaging attacks needs to be made to try and get this right. It is important, you've seen this before, because if you have a leak, it's a bad thing in terms of outcome. And, uh, who was it this morning? Was that you, David, that said about the aortic regurgitation? Somebody said about, uh, you said, Peter, that the reason why uh, it's bad is because these people have had AS and now they've got AR and they're not used to it. That's the first uh, plausible explanation I've heard and, that's, and I kind of buy that. Now, Therefore, we had to have a system other than what we were used to for grading paravalva regurgitation in the, in the TAVI population. And so we, it came down to this business about percentage of the circumference. So if you've got less than 10% of the circumference where there's a paravalva leak, it's called mild. And have a look at that for a second. That's a pretty small leak. That's a pretty small few pixels there, and you're calling that mild. And this one here, you know, uh, you, they're calling that moderate, and I think you wouldn't have any problem with them. Um, they're calling that one severe. And so these, all these expert uh, uh, people, including the VARC2 people who are the gold standard folks for all these criteria, have used percentage of the circumference that's leaking as the, uh, as the markers for severity. Multi-imaging, as I said, look from below, look from above, look from the apex, transesophageal, transthoracic, look from every direction. Also use some of the old-fashioned tricks like arch reversal or deceleration time or pressure half time and uh, the continuity equation. So not everything's about colour and we use, can use volumetrics and arch reversal or descending aortic reversal as markers of severity. Now as you saw, uh, new generations of valves are here and uh, these will hopefully improve some of these uh, problems uh, but not everything will be solved even by clever new technology. This is uh, Philippe Pibereau who came and spoke for us at Echo Australia um, a couple of years ago in Melbourne who is a charming gentleman who's become the world expert on the complications of TAVI. So coronary occlusion is an important complication, not so much an echo issue, but certainly the wall motion abnormalities that you see. But the assessment or the prediction of coronary occlusion is, is, is useful in echo in that if you've got leaflets that take you above, the, the, the height of the leaflet is higher than the coronary ostium, uh, that's a, uh, uh, a real practical problem. Now, Aortic root rupture is a feared and a very feared complication. In fact, we've been unlucky enough to have one of these. You can imagine that if you slightly underestimate your measurements and then blow the balloon up to full uh, expansion, so you, you say it's 21 and then so you put in a 23, but it was actually 19 and you blow that up to 23 and all of a sudden you've got a problem. And so here's an example of that. A minute or two later after blowing up the balloon, uh, all of a sudden you've got, in this case, a contained rupture. We've also had one uncontained. In this particular case, we were able to navigate out of this, but this is also a, a very feared and, and uh, frightening complication. And remember, most of these people are in this operating environment because they're not candidates for, for surgery, although uh, certainly you reassess that when, when the chips are down. <laughs> and always you publish one, you have a win. Lastly, we've got, well not lastly, a couple more complications, migration. So these things are in a dynamic, highly pressurised, generally pushing me back into the ventricle situation. Remember, these valves are closed in, uh, in diastole where the pressure is a pressure gradient from aorta to LV and you've got a hammer 100,000 times a day banging this thing down basically towards ventricle. Now the core valve type valves, I don't think that's ever going to be an issue because of the chalice shape, but these are balloon inflatable valves that just have to hang on to the annulus. If you put them in a little bit low, then we fear this phenomenon where the thing is falling uh, into the ventricle. And in fact, if you look on the top right image there, you can quite clearly see that this thing has marched itself back into the ventricle uh, and it's sitting, uh, touching onto the anterior leaf of the, of the mitral valve there. 
and uh, a great deal of angst was had about this and we went back and had a look at the images that I took in fact on the day that this one was operated a year earlier and I don't think any of us, and certainly I didn't perceive, that uh, there was this going on where you've got these tiny little bits of leaflet uh, of the, the person's own leaflet hanging above the frame which uh, at the, back in the day when we, when we were doing this some years ago we would have thought either nothing of or minimal of but what we realise is that those leaflets are like hanging over the top of the valve and gradually hammering, hammering, hammering this back so that a year later this had trans, uh, traversed itself back into the ventricle. We've seen debris on these devices, bits of rubbish. Uh, sometimes this might be uh, something that's been shredded off in the, in the mo movement process uh, and this is obviously a place where we would worry about stroke. Uh, we have also seen um, uh, uh, these devices cause perforation. Uh, I don't know that this is one of ours, I think this is a teaching set one, but with these, uh, this is uh, immediately adjacent to the uh, aortic mitral curtain and so it's not hard to fathom that this could perforate the anterior leaflet. We have seen uh, infection as you would expect with any foreign body valve implant uh, and I don't know that the management or the, or the susceptibility of this is any more or less but the, but the investigation is very similar to uh, other prosthetic valves. Um, now we haven't seen calcification problems of the valves themselves so far but these are early days but what we have seen is problems where there's big calcification in the aortic root uh, or a, a before implant and we see these things on the CAT scan and here's an example of one where we blew up the valve, this is what I would have liked to have shown you before so you can see this one now, that's how they look when they blow up in rapid ventricular pacing and for all the world that looks like it's probably okay uh, or, but maybe not and uh, uh, the, uh, there was still a leak after we blew that up. So you, you do what we do and that is we put another valve either a little higher or a little lower and this is not that far off uh, the normal bell curve of activities uh, in a calendar month to maybe one case in a calendar month or two to have to put a second valve and so that seemed like not that terrible of a thing but still after all that we had a bad leak. And what we realised was that no matter how hard we blew with the balloon, this focus of calcium was never going to allow the valve to concentrically fully inflate circle within a circle because it was, it was a chock holding it open. This piece of calcium was a chock holding it open. And so we've learned to be more respectful, I think, of these foc focal uh, calcifications in the annulus that will stop the thing from fully inflating. And in this case, we actually put a closure device in there to make the leak go away. There's an amplats are going in just to finish the day off and make the spend a little bit more uh, comprehensive. Uh, um, finally, uh, to follow up, to look at gradient, we've done this in detail this morning. Uh, Transthoracic uh, continuous wave Doppler remains the gold standard. There are some varieties of approaches where you put the pulse wave for the continuous for the continuous uh, for the continuity equation, uh, for, and so in the uh, in normal prosthetic valves, uh, surgical, and for the uh, the balloon expandable, you do what you do usually, and that is put the pulse wave cursor just below the valve. But in these in these uh, self-expanding valves, it appears that it's better to put put the uh, pulse wave cursor where you think that green LVOT plane would be, which is actually slightly within the frame, and this has been reasonably well validated. To finish up, therefore, for echo and for all the imaging in TAVI, sizing is paramount. You've got to get it right, not too big and not too small uh, to minimise the problems. We use it for positioning at deployment and most importantly for looking at regurgitation, looking at complications and long-term monitoring. Thank you very much.